Constitutional Conversations is a series of discussions by America's leading scholars about the principles, framing, ratification, and implementation of constitutional government in the United States. This series is hosted by the James Madison Memorial Fellowship Foundation of Alexandria, Virginia. Less than two decades earlier, they had broken from an empire and written a declaration of independence entirely directed toward a tyrant, as they call him. The conventional wisdom is that there was this fear of, uh, of executive power throughout the states, left over, residual from the revolution, and yet the delegates are willing to create a chief executive in some ways more powerful than King George III had been. How did that happen? Not just the delegates, but the American people, the ratification process. And how did that happen? You know, in a word, a geo, um, strategically. Um, we go back to the writs of assistance. In my story, um, the military dimension um, has been missed. The reason that Americans revolt at the end of the day is because they can, okay? Because Montreal has fallen. Um, um, and, and they don't think they need the Brits to, to protect the mommy, mommy and daddy anymore. I, you know, give me the car keys, please. Um, but it becomes clear over the course of the fighting that eventually does ensue that um, the British Empire is very, very powerful, and so is the French. Um, and don't forget the Spanish, and don't even forget the Russians elsewhere on the continent. And you need a much stronger central government than you had under the Arctic Confederation in order to win the next war. And we don't know if it's gonna be against the British or the French or the Spanish or the Russians, but there will be a next war and we need something stronger than merely NATO or the EU. Why do we need something stronger? Because if we just have a NATO or the EU, an, an alliance, um, we can have Brexit. Okay, so now there's some um, diplomatic exchange, uh, diplomatic confrontation or um, with um, uh, um, some European monarch, um, and uh, they start to um, uh, uh, flatter and cajole, let's just say South Carolina, and South Carolina says, oh, we're with Putin on this. And they break away from the United States, and now Putin puts soldiers in South Carolina because he's entitled, if, if you can have a regime that can break away, that can secede, um, Brexit-like, um, at will, and ally with some foreign power. And now you're going to have Russians in the Carolinas, which is not where you want them. So we're going to have to have an indivisible nation. Washington understands this with crystal clarity. Jefferson never does. And, in fact, and, and, the and, only and, founder on record, I believe, at least hinting at or perhaps even endorsing secession, yes, Jefferson. That yes, is. and Jefferson Davis is aptly named, and Madison covers up for his friend. You know, because Madison actually understands that um, ratification, this is a phrase that he um, uh, uh, writes in a letter that's broadcast, uh, that is, it's not broadcast, uh, my um, uh, 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 Freudian slip, but is reprinted in newspapers up and down the continent. Madison says ratification must be in toto and forever. And I actually, in the book, have South Carolina newspapers saying this. John T. Calhoun might not have known that because he doesn't have access to the internet the way I do, but I'm showing that at the time, all the newspapers in Virginia, all the newspapers in South Carolina are paying attention to what's happening in New York where actually um, a letter is being read aloud by Madison saying ratification must be in toto and forever. So Madison is good on union, and so is indivisible union, and so is Washington, and so is Hamilton. Jefferson not so much, and Madison covers up for his friend, like, like Kevin McCarthy covering up for um, Trump, something like that, because he doesn't want to admit, actually, that Jefferson was really bad on this important issue. So the Constitution is about two big things that are both about geostrategy. An indivisible union uh, on the model of Scotland and England, a union of Scotland and England led by a powerful executive because you need a powerful executive to, pre to prevent. Um, yes, we're afraid of executive power. But you know what? If we have too weak an executive, we will have executive power will be called King George III. 
you know, or Catherine the Great, or Putin, um, or King Louis. We will all be speaking Spanish, or um, uh, Russian, um, or French, or English, but it'll be the King's English and not, you know, Noah Webster, American English. We have to create an indivisible union and a strong executive, because otherwise we're going to be um, j just um, uh, recaptured by the Brits or the French or the Spanish or the Russians because they have not given up their new world ambitions. And a strong executive and a strong single executive. And One as you, person. As you know, at the Constitutional Convention, there is a, a plan floated. Perhaps we'll have three yes. executives. One to represent each geographic region right. of the country. Because that worked so well in Rome, not. Okay, yes. that's what shakes. And, and there they only had two, for goodness sake. Um, uh, well, there's the triumvirs, and, um, but um, uh, um, uh, uh, Ran uh, Randolph proposes uh, uh, this, but note that no state other than Pennsylvania has three. So once again, there is the model of the state constitutions. They have single governors, or in some places they're called presidents, except in Pennsylvania where there's a council. For geostrategic reasons, we need an indivisible union, a strong executive, and yes, a unitary executive. Just so, and the person who understands that better than anyone else, by far, is George Washington, and his right hand in all of this at Philadelphia and throughout the rest of his life is Alexander Hamilton, and Jefferson doesn't understand that he's not even there. He's often in Paris at the time. He doesn't understand indivisible union, because his idea, is um, the Declaration of Independence, which talks about free and independent states, that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, and in his model, free and independent even of each other. And they were before Philadelphia. Um, they're allowed to go off on their own. The Constitution admits, in effect, that secession, Brexit, if you will, is a pre-existing right, pre-constitutional. How does it admit that? Article 7 says this will go into effect, this new constitution, uh, um, uh, if nine or more states ratify among only the ratifying states. So we're not going to, if Rhode Island d doesn't say yes, Rhode Island is its own sovereign nation, it can in effect leave, or we can leave it, depending on how you look at it. It's, Brexit is allowed when George Washington is elected and takes his oath of office as the first president of the United States. There are only 11 states in USA 2.0. North Carolina hasn't said yes. Rhode Island hasn't said yes. But here's the Lincolnian point that Jefferson never understands. Because, again, he's off in France. The Bill of Rights is proposed in large part to bring them back um, into the fold for geostrategic reasons. And, and Washington understands this. OK, you don't have to join. You can be president. Oh, but once you're in, you're in. This is an indivisible union for geostrategic reasons. Um, and here's why, because we can't let you come in and, let's, um, and we fortify your border against Canada or what, what have you. Um, we're spending a lot of federal resources to protect you. And, um, and then if at any time you just decide that you want to turn those guns around unilaterally and point them into the bellies of the rest of us, no, we can't let you do that. That's not, and, and, and then let foreign troops in on American soil. We can't let you do that. You don't have to join. Uh, but, but good luck in the world on your own, you know, but once you're in, you're in. And that's the Washington Hamilton vision. Madison understands it. Um, he's less emphatic about it because he doesn't fight at Valley Forge. He's not there at, at, at Yorktown or, or, or Monmouth. Jefferson doesn't even really quite understand it. Oh, but old Ben Franklin does and definitely Washington and Hamilton. There's a very interesting and dangerous transition period, in fact. And Washington understands the legal, political, and military dangers of all of that. Yeah. Can they say that they are the old Articles of Confederation? He's a, acutely, this is the biggest reason he's pushing the um, Bill of Rights. Well, there are two kind of big reasons. To bring on board the skeptics of the Constitution in the states that have said yes, because many honorable Americans have actually um, uh, they've either voted very reluctantly for the Constitution or they voted against it. He wants to bring them on board. Um, and because he needs to actually, yes, get a Rhode Island and, and North Carolina back into the fold. Because otherwise, the thing could start to unravel because 
they could say, you know, you didn't really properly leave the Articles Confederation because it says you can't have a new system unless all 13 state legislatures agree. And you actually did nine, actually 11, but you only said you needed nine state conventions rather than 13 state legislatures. And oh, that's a huge legal diplomatic can a military can of worms. So Washington, he's aware that he, he, he won the day um, but there's still these um, uh, um, remnants uh, that he needs to sort of mop up in order to, to fully complete his, his victory. He understands that acutely.